everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, we're going to be discussing whether it's your borderline or you're actually very good at reading people. Before we jump in, I am drinking a strawberry passion fruit tea. This is the little baggie it comes in. And I am drinking it out of our Humans Gonna Humans mug. If you're interested, links down below for your own mug or hoodie. Delicious as always, and I haven't even sweetened it. So you know it's good. Now, to discuss today's video, I pulled out one of my oldest journals. I used I write into like little notebooks and I found who I have not looked at this journal since 2015. And I found a page in here that I think, wow, just it really goes along perfectly with today's podcast. Look, in 2015, I wasn't diagnosed with borderline. I had no idea I was suffering from a personality disorder. I thought I was just a normal queer kid abandoned by her conservative parents. I thought I was depressed, anxious, and unaliving like everybody else. I never considered that I had a personality disorder. And so I was shocked to say the least when I got diagnosed, but also comforted by this diagnosis because it meant I could get better. So I actually asked you guys for comments and feedback on today's podcast. So to summarize basically all of the comments comments and questions that I got from people. Basically, what are the practical steps we can take to make sure that it's our borderline or justified feelings when reacting to somebody? How do we know when we're splitting versus when we're actually valid in having our feelings? And then do we notice that after implementing these steps that we actually do react more reasonably over time. So first and foremost, like what is borderline? I pulled up a little summarization of it and I thought that we could use this definition. Basically, people with borderline are often on edge. They have high distress and anger levels, so they may be easily offended. They struggle with beliefs and thoughts about themselves and others, which can cause distress in many areas of their lives. People living with BPD often have intense fear of instability and abandonment. Now, You guys know I was diagnosed as like higher functioning borderline. And I really think by this definition, one of the reasons why I stabilized so quickly and was able to hold down a job, was able to have relationships, was able to have friends and people trusted me with their children. I was a professional nanny and a YouTuber part time for most of my 20s was because I had a foundation of beliefs. Usually when I was faced with somebody and I was feeling like I was splitting, it was easy for me to recognize that they were people with their own feelings, but I I couldn't always decipher whether or not I was um, understanding them fully and correctly as people, like really the same as me, like somebody who was struggling, somebody who was in pain. I often just saw them as people who had power over me, especially in a parental situation because my parents were so strict and because my parents, it's like my rules, my house, my way. It did always feel like, what am I doing here? My parents would have their own outbursts and they would say things like, you know, if you don't like my rules, you can leave. If you don't like it, you can leave. And we're like anywhere from five years old to 17. So it's a little awkward when you're a child and you're like, why are your parents telling you to leave the home? And my parents don't really mean it. They're having their own version of suffering with mental health. They're only having their own issues with their upbringing. They're having their own issues with growth. And so when they say these things, when they freak out, when they look at their children and think, oh my gosh, I'm losing control and my kids are turning out bad because they're gay and they're religious, they're having their own splitting moment. Now, remember, splitting doesn't just happen to people with borderline. It happens to people. And splitting is just a distortion to what is really happening. High emotional stress leads to deregulation. And then you start to think, oh my gosh, black and white, they're either all good or all bad. So you end up forming a misrepresentation or mis you misconstrue the situation and it's very normal. We have high stress jobs and relationships and trauma and we don't always make the best decisions. So one of the things that helped me was doing DBT and that was created by Dr. That was created by Dr. Marsha Linehan, and it really helps people with borderline. I actually found this other little piece of information that I thought we could use here and, um, This is from the borderlinepersonalitydisorder.org. This is um, most, okay, so so most people with BPD, do they get better? Nearly seven out of eight patients uh, are uh, achieved symptom remission lasting at at least four years. So I am in remission of symptoms and I am four, four years. I just cleared basically my four years. 
And the way that I describe this is that I am not having like splitting episodes. I'm not distorting. I'm not knowing that I'm not triggered. Like if I do get triggered somehow, or I do find myself becoming like emotionally confused. I know what's happening. Now, I also suffer from PTSD. So I also deal with triggers from that still. But my borderline, I feel like I have a really good and healthy relationship with. I've been married and with my partner for over a year and he does not has not yet experienced a borderline split with me. So usually if we're having any miscommunication, it's usually related to our neurodivergency or maybe um, something related to, I call it remnants of borderline where I'm like, ooh, I'm getting a spike of something. And I'm like, can we talk about it? And then we just talk about it versus in the past, I couldn't even recognize that it was my borderline, right? Now it goes on to say that half of the patients no longer meet the require the criteria for borderline personality disorder. So borderline personality disorder, if you can get the right kind of therapy, you can heal. And if you get re like reassessed, there's a chance you might not even get re-diagnosed. So the good news is regardless of what the internet says, you can get better with borderline. Now, okay, what are the practical steps to dealing with knowing whether you're splitting or actually assessing somebody correctly? And a big part of that is your philosophy on life, which goes back to why I think I was diagnosed as higher functioning. It's because I always have a strong philosophy on life. I have since I was a child. I was raised in a really religious home, which I was religious until I was 19. So it allowed me to know what it was like to have a strong, strong belief system in right and wrong. So it allowed me to hold down values, expel or, or express values and morals. It allowed me to push ethics. It allowed me to think that I could have a connection to truth, which allowed me to really center myself if I felt like I was out of control. And to be fair, with my borderline, I mostly was triggered with people who were very, very close to me. I'm less triggered when strangers don't understand me because why would they know me? But family and friends, oh my gosh. Now, Going into my journal from 2015, before I'm diagnosed, this is before Brittany got a diagnosis. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, I found this page in my journal this morning and I was, I told my partner, I was like, I need you, I need you to understand this Brittany because my partner married me never knowing this Brittany, right? How would he have access to a past version of myself? But I am nothing like this Brittany. He knows me as a very forgiving, loving uh, person who like loves people. And even though I talk like a big game about, you know, having my distance and being introverted, yes, I love people. I just want my distance from them all the same. And so he's used to me being very, compassionate and meeting people where they are and being just like very forgiving. So the irony of this from June of 2015 is I'm talking about an ex-partner and I'm talking about forgiving somebody who hurt me. And I told him, this is quote, I told him that I've never forgiven anyone and that I'm not sure that I could. Honestly, not sure anyone will ever deserve it. Not sure anyone will ever deserve it. Not sure anyone will ever deserve it. This is pre-therapy, Brittany. This is pre, like, um, moving into secular philosophy in a real way, um, in conjunction with the metaphysics and meditation, Brittany. This is pre-levels, Brittany, right? I wrote the levels. If you guys don't know my level system of introspection, links down below. This is two, Brittany. She's a two here. She's a two B. That's on my level system. If you're gonna get lost, links down below for the video, but I'm like a 2B here, right? I have a strong value system of like progressive values. I'm voting Hillary. I'm in a feminist groups. I'm marching with BLM at the time. I'm involved in queer groups. I'm involved in activism. All my friends are progressive. I'm very like staunchly left. I'm very much in that bubble. And on top of that, I'm in a poly relationship. I'm dating women and men, non-binary people. I'm involved in my communities. I'm going to um, dungeon parties every day. I'm working two jobs. I'm very involved in my community. And though the community is very much accepting of the mentally ill and we all have problems, I think most people wrote me off as probably like depressed, anxious, because that's what I thought I was as well. Now, after I got diagnosed with borderline, a lot of people came and supported me. And I really appreciate that. A lot of people reached out and said, hey, I heard about your diagnosis. Like, congratulations. Congratulations on getting that. And also me too. I'm borderline. And so that was really nice. But here is Brittany in 2015, literally saying, I've never forgiven anyone. And I don't think I ever will. Who could deserve that? After therapy, after reading 2000 books, after meditating, after going through a, an introspective journey on the levels, after really facing myself, 
I was able to forgive everybody starting with myself. I forgave myself for being sick. I forgave myself for wanting to die. I forgave myself for wanting to um, live in a world with no one there so I wouldn't get hurt. I forgave myself for being cynical and bitter. I forgave myself for so many things. And then I forgave everybody else. This Brittany today you're looking at, I have no issues with nobody. Like there is nobody in my life I need to forgive. I've already done it all. I've already had the conversations either with myself or with them. I've already let it go. Remember, forgiveness is a relationship you're having with your consciousness in relation to something you're holding on to. You don't need to go to somebody else to forgive them. You need to forgive yourself for being angry at them so you can forgive them for having trespassed, right? And then, of course, when you go to people and you seek forgiveness, you can't seek forgiveness. You have to only say you're sorry and mean it. And it's up to them if they give it to you. But it's never about you, right? So forgiveness, depending on which version you're doing, whether you're forgiving somebody else, that's about you, or somebody else is seeking forgiveness from you, that's about them. We have to let it go and forgive ourselves for being people. And then we have to do better based off of our values. So after reading this, I had just like a beautiful realization of how one, how nice it was to document these things in a journal and two, how nice it is to remember how much I've grown as a person because there was a time in which I literally thought no one deserved forgiveness, which means I thought I didn't deserve forgiveness, right? Talk about a stunted way of thinking, okay? But to that Brittany, it made a lot of sense. So what are some practical ways to double check with yourself, whether it's your borderline when you're judging someone or actually a reasonable judgment of someone. Now, remember, judging to condemn and judging to like be cynical of is different. I call it gay judging, meaning like, you know, I'm not really judging or condemning you like a religious person, but I'm like, mm, maybe not. You know, I'm like, mm, maybe not. OK, and that's what I call gay judging. So I don't want to lose you in Brittany terminology here. But again, when I am judging somebody, especially now, this Brittany, this healthy Brittany, who's done all the steps, who's done all the things, I'm really judging people, one, through my values, and two, through their values, whether or not they're keeping up with what they say they believe in, and then three, in sort of a compassionate, like, where are they on the journey, right? Because everyone's on their own journey, doing their own thing, you know, facing themselves at different times. I can't expect them to go on my journey. Look at me in my 20s, not even knowing I could forgive people. Pre-therapy, Brittany was really, really harsh. She was really, really, you know, she was loving in a lot of ways, but she was really like, you know what I mean? Like very good at cutting people off, very borderline, very good at like, nope, I'm not dealing with this. Absolutely not. But it wasn't like in a boundaries, like I know myself way. It was more like in a, I'm going to protect myself over everything. So absolutely not cut you out. Very different, right? So just like, you know, the difference between cutting people out because you're like, I'm not dealing with this. I'm not risking my safety and having good and healthy boundaries because you've already been here. You know, this is your limitation. That's what we're looking for. So let's say you're talking to somebody and you start to have a, a feeling about them based off of everything you've seen from them. Okay. They mistreat the people around them. It's subtle, but clear. They sort of like insult people slightly in conversations, but it's never really blunt. They're charismatic and loving in some ways, but also kind of make you feel bad about yourself. And you start to get the feeling like, man, I don't know if I'm just being sensitive, which is a symptom of being borderline. Or if this person's literally manipulating people around them and slightly insulting people to, you know, like, let's say chip at people's, you know, self-esteem so they can kind of get the upper hand. And you're like, oh my God, am I conspiracy theory? Like, is this a conspiracy theory move? Am I a conspiracy theorist? Am I a person who's looking at this person and, and creating a narrative around their actions when it, it might not be that? Well, that's when you sit down and you do a pros and cons list. That's what I do. So I say, okay, now, for f first and foremost, I can't read people's minds. So let's see. Okay, here's some um, data. The person does tend to insult. How many times an hour are they insulting people? Oh, I notice they throw around insults like five times during dinner tonight, every hour. Oh, this person's fat. Oh, this person's too skinny. Oh, this person doesn't eat enough. Oh, this person eats too much. Oh, this person, like, for somebody so smart, they're kind of dumb. For somebody so this, they're kind of this. Oh, the way they chip at the people at the, oh, the host. Oh, I love your house. Um, I'm surprised you could afford it. Mm, interesting way to phrase that. Okay. And it's like you're taking notes. And then at the end of the night, you still might not know. But what you can tell is that you do have the written down data. You have the literal evidence 
that you're not just blowing things out of proportion. There's like a stack of evidence compared to everyone else at the dinner table who not once insulted anybody. So hmm, this person stands out. Now you can see in that moment, you have the data. It's not your borderline dudes. You know you have the data. Now, let's say somebody's talking to you and they say something um, casually over politics and they say something like, Oh man, I'm so bad at pronouns. It can be so exhausting figuring it out. And all of a sudden you're like, what do you mean it's hard figuring out? What, you can't figure out a pronoun? You can't figure out a pronoun? It's like, whoa, dude, they didn't say anything. All they said is it's hard figuring out pronouns. And look, as somebody who dabbles in gender fluidity and everything, it is, and I understand, complicated dealing with pronouns. But is that your sensitivity building up? Is that your borderline? Is that you getting defensive? Is that you, or is that... Is that, does that make sense according to the data? So what data do we have about this person? Well, they've been kind all night. They pronoun people correctly. They um, have good intentions. They have good energy. And then they expressed an exact, you know, um, an, a sort of like, oh, like this can be difficult in random conversation, but also wasn't malicious. Okay. I think I'm just being too sensitive. I think I have a reason to be sensitive because people are a-holes and they do disregard people's pronouns and people are transphobic, but okay, I think I think I think this isn't fair to this person, but I'm also allowed to hold judgment. I'm allowed to be cynical. I'm allowed to say maybe this person is transphobic or maybe I'm just sensitive because I don't want to be around someone who's transphobic. Those are the differences, right? In a very practical way, you're always looking for evidence. You're always saying this opinion isn't coming out of nowhere, but then you want to take it a step further. This is Britney's mode. Go into detail of categorization. So you'll look at people on the internet, right? You'll look at five different kinds of guys or girls and how they treat their partners. And all of them have cheated on their partners, but all of them are having a completely different relationship with cheating. One person is incredibly remorseful, held accountable, and absolutely takes responsibility and never blames their partner for their choices. One person takes accountability, but in the process also blames their partner for having cheated. The other person says, I'm going to cheat no matter what. I don't even care about your feelings. The fourth person says like, is cheating even a thing? Even though I agreed I wouldn't do this, like, is it that bad? The fifth person goes like, you know, I don't, I'm going to cheat whether you like it or not. Like, I literally don't care about your feelings. Every single person is having a different relationship with cheating and there are different types of people who have cheated, which is why we don't believe here on this channel, once a cheater, always a cheater, because that doesn't make any sense. Your past doesn't define you. Your past is only information to make sense of the present, how you got here in the first place. I am not going to judge you for your past. I might be hesitant to engage with you because of your past, because I'm not sure if you've transformed. Watch last week's podcast about this. When you're dealing with people, how do you know they've changed or transformed versus just pretended to? And that's really difficult, but you have to start with knowing yourself. Again, when we have a problem with people, we're really having a problem with ourselves, whether it's not accepting them for who they are, hoping they'll change, or not understanding them in the first place. So when we talk about is it our borderline or are we right about people, we're really saying, do we know ourselves? Do we know if we're triggered right now? Do we know if it's our borderline? Do we know if we're assessing information correctly? One of the things I feel like I always have to do, not just as a woman, but as somebody with borderline, is say, no. I know what I'm saying. This isn't my mental illness. This isn't my gender. I'm telling you right now, the information I have makes sense. The evidence I have points in a direction. You can argue with the evidence, but you've got to give me counter evidence. One of the things I constantly have to do in my life is make it clear to people, no, no. You can say, oh, Britney's just unhinged. Britney's a girl. Britney has borderline. Britney's just emotional. Britney's sensitive. But Britney also has the evidence and the receipts. So let's go, queen. Let's fight this out because that is the moment in life Everyone has this happen regardless of your background or gender. There's a reason people will doubt you. They'll pick that thing that they decide makes you less than them and they'll hone in on it and say that's the reason what you're saying doesn't matter. So no matter if you're borderline or anxious or depressed or biased in some way because we all have biases, every time somebody asks you, are you sure about that or are you just biased? Ask yourself the question first. Am I sure about this or is this my borderline? Why do I think this? Where is it coming from? So just like when in, D when in DBT, and again, I'm not a therapist, so I can't explain to you DBT. I just recommend you take it. But just like in DBT, when you're feeling yourself having 
a possible splitting moment, you've got to ask yourself, like, who are you? Where are you? Where's the danger? And are you safe? And you have to ask yourself, you know, is this real? And is what I'm seeing real? Is what I'm feeling real? Am I really threatened right now? Or do I just feel very overwhelmed? Do I feel very scared? Do I feel very unsure? Am I getting mixed signals from people? Am I misunderstanding people? Because don't get me wrong, growing up in the home that I did, it was very confusing. There were times in my life when my parents would say things and they say things like religious people. When I was 14, many of you know, I asked my mother before I came out, even though my mother knew she had been asking me if I liked girls forever and I had been denying it. She asked me, or I asked my mom at 14, would you rather have a dead child or a gay child? And my mom said a dead child because a dead child would go to heaven. Very religious answer, but that was very like, no wonder I have borderline, right? And so I sat there and I I internalized that so much over the years since I was eight years old until I was older. I was internalized. I was internalizing everything I heard about queer people around me, everything I heard about gay people, everything I heard about trans people. I was internalizing, 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 pre-abandoning myself because everyone around me had already abandoned the queer people just by listening to politics, by listening to debates, by having conversations with religious people. I mean, I grew up in a time when being an atheist was like the worst thing you would do. When you came out as an atheist, when I was growing up, that was like coming out like a predator because an atheist doesn't have morals or values. An atheist is a person Person, that you don't know what they'll do to you because they don't have the consequence of God or, or sin or hell. So of course, growing up, coming out as an atheist at 19 and then a queer person at 21, it was a very intense moment for my family. And I got a lot of feedback from people all over my family who were confused about why I was posting on YouTube that I was gay. Why was I posting in the world that I was an atheist? Why was I spreading this misinformation about God? Why was I doing these things? Why was I sinning openly? And so you have to realize when you're going through that, when you're challenging everyone around you, every political person you voted for or believed in or the world you were raised in, when you're challenging everyone, you feel so alone. And you're asking yourself like, am I making a huge mistake? Am I the one who's genuinely crazy? And then the irony of course is that they made you crazy, but they didn't even mean to. And that's the hardest part about it. And that's why Brittany in 2015 who couldn't forgive, I wish she could meet me now. I wish she knew she was going to grow into a person who could forgive. Because I learned, much like my borderline was something that someone gave me, much of the trauma around the people in my life was something that someone gave them. And I realized that they didn't know how to break that generational curse, and so it would land with me. It doesn't matter if you have borderline, okay? It doesn't matter if you've cheated in your past. It doesn't matter. What matters is who you are right now, in this moment. So when you're having a moment, and you don't know if you're splitting or if you're actually like having a whoo moment, like an Eureka moment, you need to look for the evidence. You need to reassure yourself with the evidence or do what I do, which is like, this is my opinion. This is how I feel. I could be wrong, but I'm not budging. I'm not going to have people double guess me for something that my intuition and the evidence of my life has shown me. But if I am wrong, I will absolutely make a video about it. I will make a statement about it because sometimes, you know, people do want you to be extra cautious about judging or gay judging them because they don't want you to be so wrong about them or so right about them that people start to look at them differently. And that's the issue. So what they'll do is they'll turn it around and look at you differently and say, maybe you're the problem. And maybe you are, girl. Maybe you are the problem. And that's why you have to do your steps, okay? The, the good news is, is when you do your steps, when you realize yourself, when you ask yourself for evidence in the moment, you still get to say, I don't want to have this conversation. I'm walking away. You still get to say, hey, I'm feeling uncomfortable, overwhelmed, and overstimulated. I'm going to go meditate. You get to say, hey, I like you. I love you. You're a good person. That doesn't mean we have to get along. You get to be open, but have boundaries. I'm open, but I have boundaries, right? You want to be healthy, happy, kind, right? You want to understand that humans are going to human. All the slogans we say on this channel, you want to do all of these things, and you still want to pick yourself because you've got to say healthy, happy, kind, which means prioritizing your consciousness. So again, whether you're splitting or not, you get to walk away from a situation. There will be so many situations where people in my life will overstimulate me. They'll, they'll, like I remember I told you guys I got into an argument with my brother before I came to Europe and he was asking me like, should trans people be in schools? 
that question doesn't make any sense at all. But to a conservative, they think they're making sense. They think that makes sense. That's a good question. That's a horrible question. It doesn't make any sense. Do you mean trans kids? Do you mean trans teachers? Do you mean trans people? And what they meant was drag queens. They didn't even mean trans people. I was like, what do you mean trans people in schools? They're like, you know, when they go to like rallies and they dance and, and drag. And I was like, you mean drag? Drag is not trans. They're like, isn't that the same thing? And then they talk to you. And as you're telling them, like, that's not what that is. They're like, oh, you're getting so emotional. Liberals are so emotional. And then you feel kind of crazy because you're sitting there like you're not even using words correctly. And then you're the one who's like overstimulated. And all of a sudden you're crying. And all of a sudden they're like, see, Britney's unhinged. Britney's weak. Britney's such a liberal. Britney doesn't know anything. But you have like five people yelling at you about how you don't know what you're talking about when they are literally conflating drag with trans. And so you're just like, oh, my gosh, what is this? This is humans being human. You have the right to be overstimulated and walk away and still be right. You have the right to acknowledge that your borderline is acting up, you're overstimulated, and you're wrong with how you're assessing the person, but at the same time, you still have the right to leave, right? Let's say somebody means really well and somebody is saying something that's starting to trigger you and your abandonment issues, and they don't mean to. They're just being themselves. They're genuinely not being malicious. And you find yourself splitting and you're looking at them like, oh my gosh, are they dangerous? That's okay. You're not a bad person because you had a splitting episode. You're not a bad person because you got triggered. You're not a bad person because you got triggered. I know on the internet they will punish you. They will tell you you're responsible for your mental health and you're a bad person for getting triggered. You're not. You are responsible for your mental health. But the people around you, if they treat you getting triggered like you're a bad person, they are not people you need to be around. They are not. You know, I'm really lucky now. I have a group of, I have nine siblings. So the group of my siblings that are really, really aware of my mental health, if I am ever overstimulated or triggered, they're usually very good at handling it. They're very compassionate. They're very, they don't hold it against me. They don't punish me for it. They're just like, ah, oh, she just like got it. Like it's too much. She just needs a moment. Those are the people you need to surround yourself with. And if you can't, you need to be that person for yourself. You need to be that person in your life who says, I've got my own back. I'm going to be there to help me. I'm going to be there to love me. I'm going to be there to understand me. All of this will absolutely make your life better, which goes into the second part of once you do these steps over and over and over and over and over again, you will absolutely get better. You will hit remission. You will have less borderline splitting. You will have less issues. You will absolutely be able to regulate more. You will have better relationships with yourself and other people. You 100% will get better. But you have to do the work. One last part of the podcast I really got to hit home on, and this is the hard part, so hear me out. Your borderline is not the reason you're not getting better. Your borderline is not the reason you're not getting better. This is really hard to recognize because your borderline feels like the reason you're not getting better. It feels like a curse. It feels like the worst thing to happen to you only because you're not ready to get better. Because to get better means radical change. It means transforming yourself into a different version of yourself. This is Brittany in 2015. Couldn't even believe she could forgive people. 2015 Brittany didn't believe in forgiveness. She thought there was nobody who could deserve it. She had to transform into a person who could not only forgive herself, but forgive the people around her. It took her two years. Well, it took her her whole life. But 2015, Brittany, um, I got diagnosed in 2017. So two years after this, I was diagnosed with borderline. And it took me um, about till 2018, 2019, when I forgave myself, I started to learn how to forgive people. It was very quick. I'm not going to lie to you. It was very quick. Therapy was quick. Everything went quick. I, within a year, I was like bouncing off walls, like forgiving people, moving on. Now, it was a journey. So what I would end up doing was like I would forgive myself and then I would practice forgiving people and it wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect. I would like I would try to talk to my parents 
and I would learn to forgive them and radically accept them, but I would still get triggered. And I was like, okay, how do I not get triggered? But at least I knew I was getting triggered. And I would say, I love you. I, I need to go home. And I didn't live with my parents because when I do it, it just triggers me. So I was like, I love you so much. I can't be here. And I'm going to go back to my apartment, but I'll come visit you tomorrow. And I would come visit them tomorrow because then they would get hurt. And they were really good people. My parents have done so much work to be better people over the years. And I think a lot of it was because I gave them tools from Borderline, from um, DBT. So for me, I feel like to break the generational curse was to give my parents tools that they would never get themselves because they don't believe in modern day therapy. So my contribution to my family legacy is to give my family medical or mental health tools so they can be better. And they have, they've absolutely changed. They've really done the work. They've tried so hard. They're not perfect where no one is perfect, but it is so much better now. It is so much better. My mom and I specifically were like very close. We're very good at giving each other space. I mean, I live in Croatia now, but still like we are very good at giving each other space and loving each other and being very ready to say I love you I'm open I have boundaries I have to go home I love you I love you I gotta go home it's very much about loving someone enough to meet them where they're at but mostly meeting yourself where you're at it's all about us as narcissistic as that sounds it's all about us we have to forgive ourselves so we can forgive people we have to love people or love ourselves so we can love people we have to understand ourselves so we can understand people we have to really want a relationship with ourselves. So many people will help other people at the expense of themselves and run themselves into the ground with alleged kindness. How can you be kind to others if you can't be kind to yourself? And then you run yourself into the ground and you're no longer available for those people. And so you hurt both yourself and your community. It's a very common cycle. It makes a lot of sense. I get it. I'm not judging you for it. I'm just pointing it out. So again, when you think to yourself, my borderline is the reason I'm not getting better. No. It's okay if you're not ready to heal. But eventually you have to make that decision. And it's very hard to make. I am literally telling you right now, it is very hard to make. It is very difficult to make the decision to get better. Right? Check out last week's podcast about transformation. I think it will really help, especially in relation to this podcast. All right. So, some practical ways, and then that's it for today's podcast. So get my notes out here. Okay, practical ways to double check yourself in the moment. So we went over some of them, right? Look for evidence. That's really important. Take time to look for evidence. Don't worry about doing it in the moment. So much of pressure, so much pressure that comes on us is like in the moment, react accordingly. I am not that person. There was a stream I had a few months ago when I was reviewing Leo Skeppy and like 4,000 people came into my YouTube room and I was like, guys, I didn't react. My brain panicked so hard that I was like, don't react. If you react, they'll troll you because I thought it was somebody raiding me who's going to troll me and then like make fun of me or something. And I wasn't sure what to do because I was like, oh, I've never had this many people in my live show before. Instead of engaging with it, instead of being like a normal streamer and saying like, hey, guys, welcome. I don't know where you're from, but hello. I couldn't do that. I freaked out. My head, my brain was panicking. I was like, oh my God, like I should act normal. Just act like it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter if there's 4,000 people here or 100 people here. Like I'm the same person. So what does it matter? But it was also like a denial of the situation. It was almost like I was denying that was happening. And my comments were like, Brittany, what's going on? And I was like texting people in Discord. Like, I don't know what's going on. What the F is going on? But isn't that strange that in that moment, I didn't engage with reality. I was so afraid of engaging in the moment. I was like, no, I'm, I'm pretty conflict avoidant, actually, like for a person. And in that moment, I was like, avoid the conflict, avoid the conflict. But I was like, why didn't I just act like a normal streamer and say, hey, guys, welcome to my stream. I'm so glad you're here. Why didn't I do that? Oh, because I was literally so afraid in my brain. It was for sure going to be someone attacking me. It was for sure going to be somebody like raiding me for a bad thing because sometimes that happens. Like when does, when do you ever get raided by 4,000 people? And I literally thought Leo Skeppy's like people were going to come hate on me because I was hating on Leo Skeppy. And I realized in that moment that I, I still have a lot of fear even in my job about like not knowing how to handle situations in the moment. And I think that's pretty common for people with trauma. And I think that's okay. 
it's okay to make sure you know what's going on and to talk to yourself through it and to be like, okay, you don't know how to react in the moment. So give yourself time to react later. And now is later. Now I can say, okay, now that I've meditated on that and I've thought about it, it didn't trigger me. I didn't cry about it. I didn't want to hurt myself. I didn't have an episode. I didn't split, but I was paralyzed by the fear. And so I did the one thing I knew how to do in that moment and I acted like it didn't matter. And that's a good cope, but it's not the answer to why I acted that way. And now I look back and I go, okay, next time I get a 4,000 person raid, I'm going to let go of the fear and invite optimism into my life and manifest like positive energy and welcome everybody into the community because that is the appropriate response. But I needed a while to really meditate on it, to realize that that was the right response. So give yourself a moment to think. There is always this pressure to react exactly in the moment, exactly perfectly. Give yourself a moment to think. It's the best thing you can do for yourself and even for your communities, for your family, for your friends. And if you have a spouse, even talk to them through it and say, babe, babe, I love you. I think I need a moment to think. I think that's the most honest way for me to convey my most honest truth. Because in the moment, sometimes people will be like, just talk to me, tell me, tell me what you're thinking. But if you don't have things in place to reassure your partner, some of your intrusive thoughts might come out and they might not be honest. So my partner and I, we both have set up boundaries that allow us to share our our intrusive thoughts without thinking they're personal or real because we don't believe they're real. Like I don't believe my intrusive thoughts are real. I think they're just like from trauma and they're like floating around little like entities, but I don't think they're real because they're intrusive, right? So when I have one, sometimes I'll like, I'll listen to them for a while and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And I know a lot of people don't hear thoughts in their head, but obviously for those of us who think we're having those thoughts, right? My partner will be like, are you having intrusive thoughts? And I'm like, yeah, they're really loud today. And he's like, what are they saying? And again, it's not like schizophrenia where you're literally hearing voices. You're hearing your own voice. You're just thinking, but you're not thinking actively. It's not intentional thinking. It's like they zoom by. Like they, they're like intrusive thoughts of your own voice. That's why you think that it's you. Because you think you want to die or you think you want to hurt yourself, but then you realize it's a cope for feeling in control or it's a trick of the trauma. And so you have to do the right kind of therapy to understand like, okay, this isn't me. I don't want to do these things. I haven't self-harmed. I've been really good for four years. I've been out of suicidal ideations for four years. I haven't wanted to unalive myself. I know I joke about it sometimes, but like I've been good for like four years. So I'm like, okay, what is going on really? Like what's the thing in my head? And then I'll tell my partner like, they're being kind of mean. And I'll say like, okay, I'm thinking these thoughts. I'm having these thoughts about my body or about the way I think or the way I talk or the way I am, or I'm having these thoughts about these things. And that will be the thing that I have to meditate on and say like, okay, so that's not me. That's my intrusive thought. And this isn't what I'm thinking, but this is what I'm feeling. And this is what my feelings sound like when manifested. Okay. So I'm like, I'm putting everything in the right category. Like, oh, what is this? Oh, this goes here. Imagine like a bookshelf. I put everything like a little glass jar and I put it on the right shelf. It goes along with, I'm a very visual learner. So I need like a visual representation of what I'm doing with my intrusive thoughts. So I put them like in a little jar and I put them up on a shelf and I go, thank you. And even when I have callers and I work with people, you know, in a philosophy way, and we go through the steps of like existential dread. I'm like, okay, thank you for your call. And then I take that caller and I put their identity in like a little jar and I put it on the shelf. In case they call me again, I can like pick it off the shelf and remember who they were. But I also don't want to like think about my callers all the time because you guys are like your own people. So I try not to like mama Simon worry about people and I try to put that on the shelf because one of the manifestations of my borderline is I'm afraid I'm going to abandon people accidentally and I don't want to do that. But I also need to have boundaries because people want a lot more of me than I can give. And so it's like this catch 22 of like, I don't want to abandon people because I know what abandoning feels like, but I also can't over promise to people because I will then abandon them by over promising to them. So I have to be open, but with very strong boundaries about like, this is a professional relationship. We have to be very, you know. Getting to know yourself and then getting to know boundaries and then getting to know people and their boundaries, it's a journey and it's a lot of work. So don't be afraid to have boundaries in terms of space. Don't be afraid to isolate. Don't be afraid to stand your ground. Don't be afraid to see people for who they are. Don't be afraid to be compassionate and loving and understand people's nuances and differences from you. But mostly, don't be afraid to just take a breath. So much in life is the pressure to perform. And I think it makes sense sometimes, but sometimes it is to our detriment. 
So how do you know if it's your borderline or if you're making a good assessment of somebody? Look at the evidence. Do the work to look at the evidence and gather it appropriately. Know you are biased. Know you have prejudice. Know you are flawed. Understand that you can look at somebody and be absolutely wrong about your assessment of them. And then get ready to shift your information to the factual information so you can reassess accordingly. The truth will set you free. There's nothing better than the truth because it's impersonal. It has nothing to do with you or me. The truth is the truth is the truth. It's not even personal. And that's why it's so freeing. See, a lie, a lie can be personal because it's not about, you know, you or me. It's about a version of you and me that don't even exist, which is why it's so scary. But the truth, the truth is about objectivism. It's about what is objectively true. Now, we might not always have access to that. And that's when you have to go on intuition and faith. And that's where caution is important. You know, we just reviewed um, Tammy Peterson's uh, relationship with healing through cancer and how she credits a lot of the rosary to that, but she's not sure. And again, because the scientists don't know and the, you know, we don't know, we can only subjectively believe in some truth that we think is the answer, but somewhere out there is an objective truth. So when you're having those moments of assessing someone and you're not sure, remember somewhere out there is the objective truth, but you might not have access to it. And you still have the right, even though you don't have access to that, to show caution. You still have the right to say, you know, I'm not sure about you, but for caution's sake, I'm going to, I'm going to take a step back. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with playing it safe, right? Just make sure it coincides with your joy. And if you guys want, I have a link down below with the differences between happiness and joy. You guys can check that out as well. Remember that our goal, no matter where we are in the introspective journey, whether we're twos or fives, we're always focused on finding our joy. And I think that is kind of the best goal in life if you had to prescribe one to people would be to find their joy. Okay, guys, with that said, I'm going to get going. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you next week for the podcast. I don't know what it's going to be about yet, but I'm sure it's going to be good. Okay, I can't wait to read your comments, so please leave them down in the sections below, and I will see you uh, in next week's podcast. Bye! And my head in real life falling dead My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Then